Hey, welcome to the podcast. It's Chopper here, and we are Chop Shopping today with Kyler Berkman. A lot of you lacrosse fans know exactly who he is. Um, he probably wouldn't toot his own horn, so I will. This man is a three-time first-team All-American at Salisbury. Two of those years, he was the midfielder of the year. He is a 2008 player of the year at Salisbury. He's a two-time national champion, two-year captain, capped all that off with a pro career that included uh, LXM Pro, MLL Bayhawks, a career that got cut a little bit short by an incident that we'll talk about later, and uh, was an assistant coach at Salisbury uh, before moving his way up to a head coaching ranks. And he, he was the uh, head coach at D3 Aurora University for nine years. Six of those years, he was coach of the year. So the man can not only play, he can coach it up. And he's currently the GM for uh, True Lacrosse for the state of Illinois. Kyler, welcome to the show, brother. We got a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, thanks for having me on. All right, well, you know what? With all that going on, I'm a simple creature. Let's start at the beginning, man. Why don't you start about how you got started as a human being and as a lacrosse player? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, it, it takes me back. Uh, when you first reached out, I just started thinking about, you know, how did it all come about? And I was just thinking about when I was younger, you know, everything was a competition. You know, my my father made, you know, everything was a competition. I wanted to play every sport, you know, if it was soccer, if it was basketball. I mean, growing up in Salisbury, Maryland, there's not a lot of ice, right? It doesn't get very cold there. But the one day out of the year that we had enough of that ice frozen over to go out and play hockey, my dad was an upstate New York guy. I was going out and I was playing hockey for one or two days a year. You know, I, I remember... Um, him uh you know getting out on the basketball court and I always wanted to beat him at 20 at 21 you know shooting free throws throwing layups and uh would always get to 19 and dad always seemed to go on a hot streak right there at the end and, and take it to me I mean I don't think it was till I was 25 that I actually beat him at something uh I beat him in ping pong and he had just torn his meniscus and couldn't even walk right but I would you know you would have thought I won an, another national championship that day um so you know, it was just kind of growing up in that competitive environment and 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 wanting to stay with that um, throughout, you know, high school and, and having a vision for it early on, uh, being around, you know, such a great coach and, and so many great players, I think, really created that vision for me. And, you know, that's something I, I always try and impress upon parents now being on the other side, uh, you know, as a youth mentor, really, in, in what I do with true lacrosse and in the club lacrosse world is, you know, create that vision for for your youngster, um, get him on a college campus so he sees what it looks like, you know, go out and, and see a game of, of a higher level so they know what it looks like to play at that level and, you know, create that vision for them over time so they can see what maybe they, they can strive to be or what they want to be. And, and I was very fortunate enough to be put in that situation very early on um, in my career. So, you know, played a lot of sports growing up. Um, you know, was a pretty good soccer player. I think at one point I thought I was going to be a soccer player over a lacrosse player. Um, and then it was around high school, 10th grade, I discovered, you know, hey, I can be pretty good at this game. Um, and it was about then that, you know, I'd started following the lacrosse team at Salisbury quite a bit. Um, my dad, you know, he was a lead by example guy. He was uh, always in the gym, always working out, ran triathlons. I remember you know, they used to do uh, the run test every fall. Um, my dad was leading the pack. You know, he was first in the run test every fall. And uh, he actually let me compete in it as well uh, a couple of years. And, you know, I'll never forget um, when I was 13 years old, I, I had I'd been running for a couple of years and uh, I got to do the run test. And, you know, if, if you lost to Kyler at the run test at Salisbury, you were in the breakfast club. So I remember, you know, we're about halfway through the mile and a half test and I'm running by Jason Kaufman, who's, you know, still to this day, the uh, all time NCAA points leader um, in the history of men's lacrosse and him cursing me, you know, as I ran by him, knowing that it was probably going to mean a, a couple extra early mornings down the road. So, um, you know, yeah, that's that's where it started. And, and my father kind of always preached and, and I'm a big quote guy, too. So, you know, I, I might throw a couple out there. Um, you know, he always preached 10 percent is the game, 
you know, 90% is the practice. And for a young player, you, you got to love the process. You got to love the, the sweat equity. You got to enjoy seeing the, the changes happen in your game, seeing the changes happen in your body when you start, you know, working out and putting in time in the weight room. Um, and if you don't love that process, then you're not ultimately going to achieve some of the things that maybe you, you want to achieve. You know, if, if um, you're just kind of hoping and you're, you're going out there without a plan, then it's probably not going to happen for you. And that plan, you know, a, a man without a plan is a fool. Um, that plan is going to set you up for success as, as you move down the line. Um, so, you know, that kind of mentality of, of loving the process, I fell in love with that early on. You know, I was in the weight room in, in eighth grade, um, you know, maybe not knowing what I, I, I know now. Nowadays, I feel like kids have so much access to, to knowledge when it comes to the weight room and what they should be doing at certain ages. And, you know, they should really be taking advantage of that. I'm not saying you got to go out and lift you know, 225 on the bench 10 times when you're in eighth grade, but, you know, understanding the mechanics of how to do a bench press properly, those things are important. And if you're not taking time to do those things, someone else is right now. I was actually on Instagram this morning and uh, saw one of our true lacrosse 2028s out in Maryland. Um, and his dad's a strength coach and he's got him doing, you know, single arm, you know, bar raises. And I'm just like, that's where we're at nowadays, you know, if, if you want to be great at, at any sport, not just lacrosse, any sport, really. So, you know, you said you're a man of sayings. Um, I heard one that's right in, in concert with what you said, and that is when it's game time, when you're everybody's out there pushing and shoving, every, they talk about the will to win. At that point, everybody's got the will to win. The winner is the one who had the will to prepare, right? So, you know, that's what sets you apart, just what you're talking about. And I think a lot of young athletes can relate to what you said too, which is I'd rather practice my sport than do anything else. And because that, that's, you know, whether it's putting or throwing a lacrosse ball or shooting a basketball, if you don't love that practice, you're not going to put the time in or the effort in during the time. And uh, for me, it was basketball. For my son, it was lacrosse. But in both cases, hey, I, I'd rather do this than, you know, go swimming or, or have fun. You know, it, it was it was that much fun. So definitely can relate to both those things. Keep going. Yeah. So, you know, that that process was I mean, you know, to your point, uh, to the, that process for me was something that I spent a lot of time doing. I was playing wall ball in high school quite a bit. You know, when I got to college, I was spending three hours a day on lacrosse. You know, I'd wake up, I'd go to the weight room early, I'd go to the wall, I'd go shoot. You know, I'd make competitions with myself with different exercises on the wall, just trying to see how many I could do in a minute or two minutes or, you know, how how many times I could hit the corner, the one inch corner of the goal, you know, um, in, in 10 reps in 20 reps and 30 reps and, and making it a game within the game, you know, um, uh, you gotta, you gotta want to compete. And, and, you know, when you get to the game, um, everybody wants to win, you know, those who want to practice are the ones who are going to ultimately probably come out on top at the end of the day. So, you know, uh, father had a good one that I always really love to, uh, the five P's prior preparation prevents poor performance. You know, that prior preparation goes a long way. Um, so, so, so let me, so, yeah, that you. takes me to here. Yeah. You, you mentioned something to me, um, that I thought would be, our, our uh, audience would be interested in, and that is, you know, it, it's not just a matter of hard work. You have to have the plan first and you have to follow the plan. And you mentioned that, you know, when you're coaching, you'll go to practice and ask one of your players, what are you working on today? And follow through with that. Cause you know, it's not just a matter of saying what you're going to work on. You got to make sure you stick to that plan. Right. Exactly. I, you know, I think it's really important. And a lot of young guys, I, I always like to ask, like you just said, you know, what are you working on today? And all right, coach, I'm, I'm working on shooting on the run. Okay. So what are you going to do? Uh, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to drop the balls. I'm going to, okay. And then I, you know, I watch him for 10, 15 minutes and it very quickly turns into time and room shooting, you know, because shooting on the run is tough. 
shooting on the run when you're by yourself is challenging. Everybody likes to shoot time in room. So, you know, I let them kind of go for 10 or 15 minutes and I bring them in and say, hey, um, you know, do you know, and I have this thing that I go through the, the five ways to practice shooting. Um, you know, if, if you want to practice for, for speed, if you want to practice for accuracy, for deception, for quickness of release, or for inside finishing, you know, and so I, I kind of educate them on the various ways that you can practice each of those facets of the shooting. And then, okay, here's how you practice A, here's how you practice B, C, D, E, and so forth. Say, okay, so today's Monday, you're going to shoot five days a week. Well, why don't we practice quickness of release today? You know, and, and here's three drills that we're going to do for quickness of release. And very quickly, they can see, oh, there's, there's a little bit more to just saying, I'm going to go practice shooting on the run than just going and, and dropping the balls on the turf. So um, that intelligence to the process is what will help you become a better player over time. Um, any greats, you know, the, listening to Kobe or LeBron, like, you, you know, you have the, that, that plan in place when you go to practice. Um, and, and that's what's going to take you um, to the next level. Sure. So um, talk a little bit about so-called luck, because I know you said you had opponents when you wheel a goal in and they say, man, that was luck. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, one of my favorite quotes uh, that I've heard along the way, you know, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. And uh, I think it was a, a famous philosopher that said it. Um, I heard it from my dad. But, you know, you, I always like to ask kids because I throw that one out a lot at practice. And I always like to ask kids, what does that mean? And they all kind of stand there and stare, you know, weary eyed and glass eyed at you. You think about it, all right? You, you hit a BTB shot in a game, and the guy on defense goes, man, that was lucky. And you think to yourself, well, you know what I did for 100 reps yesterday? I sat at five and five, and I practiced shooting behind the back for that corner. So while you think it was lucky, I prepared for that opportunity to happen in the game, and I set myself up to do it by knowing where I practiced it at and then I executed what I had prepared to do. So, you know, that's, it's not luck. There's not a lot of luck. It's a lot of what you do beforehand that's going to set you up for the opportunity when it presents itself. And uh, that's one of my favorite quotes. And I think it really holds true with any sport that you play. Sure, sure. You know, um, for those of people who may not be familiar with Salisbury, um, it's the you know, the preeminent program in D3, your father has coached. I mean, you tell me how many championships has, has he coached his team to? It's, I think he's up to a dozen now. Um, yeah. So, so he is the winningest coach in NCAA lacrosse history. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. And, 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 you know, here on the West coast, we've got a group of ex Salisbury players who have formed rogue lacrosse. They've got a great program going. Um, they spoke, every one of them spoke with reverence about coach, um, uh, Coach Berkman at, at, at Salisbury. So here's my question for you. You grew up, you know, when he, your dad's a successful coach there, took you maybe until middle school, high school to realize lacrosse was really going to be your thing. When it came time to graduate high school and pick a college and a program, was there any debate at all on whether or not you would be going to Salisbury? I get that question all the time. It's funny you ask me that. Um, you know, I looked at some other schools. I, I had the Brown coach sitting in my living room at one point. You know, I visited Towson, talked to Maryland, a um, couple other D3 schools. But uh, I think, you know, once I saw the tradition and I had been a part of it over time, um, I think a little piece of me always kind of knew I wanted to be a seagull from, from early on. And, and I think the other thing, uh, you know, being a competitive guy, I wanted an opportunity to win a championship. And there's not a lot of places, and especially back then, you know, Brown got pretty good when I was in college, but they weren't in the conversation for a national championship. Neither was Towson. Towson's a, you know, perennial powerhouse now in the top 20, but they weren't in that conversation back when I was playing. And so, you know, you looked at the schools with the history and opportunity to do that, you know, Salisbury was, was first in line. Um, and so I think that a little piece of me always knew 
my father was never big on the recruiting front in, in terms of like, you know, he stayed very hands off um, and, and, you know, wasn't necessarily the first guy I talked to at Salisbury. Uh, it was actually Justin Axel, who's still the assistant coach there to this day. Um, and, you know, I, I had an assistant coach, Dave Dobbins, who I give a lot of credit to, you know, if he ever listens to this, I love him dearly because um, he had to put up with a lot of stuff in college, you know, having this, the, the son of the coach and he kind of took the reins from dad when it come to dealing with me. And uh, I, you know, I just, it, it's a tough place for an assistant coach to be. And I, I just reflecting now, 15 years later, he did a great job. Yeah. You know, that, that was actually my follow up question, which is how was it playing for your dad? Did it affect the way he coached you or the rest of the team? And did it affect you the way you were being coached? Yeah. You know, I, I, he'll be the first one to say, and I've heard him say this before, it helped that I was pretty good. You know, I think when you look at some father-son duos or even in youth sports, it can get pretty tough sometimes that the son's not a very good player, you know, and, and maybe he's playing when he shouldn't play or he's on the team when he shouldn't be on the team. That was never really the question, you know. Um, so I, I think it was very – fortunate to be in that scenario but um you know uh but you know there was a good anecdote to, to that that I learned I think um you know that I think every player and I try and teach this to guys and it's it's really hard for kids to understand like do what coach says you know like if coach says don't shoot outside of eight yards there's a reason that coach is saying that it's because, you know, maybe last game we missed too many outside shots or our shooting percentage was low or we want to make sure we get the extra pass. You know, like there's a method to the madness with your coach. And I learned very early on in college that you listen to coach the first time. And I remember, you know, Mike Liguori, uh, it was one of my college teammates coming down in practice from 13 yards. And everyone on the field was like, don't shoot it because he's got a fast break and you know he's going to take the shot. And what does he do? He hits it off the pipe. Everyone's on the end line and he's getting chewed out, you know. <laughs> and so I, I learned very early on not to, to put him in that situation by going against something that he was saying. Right. OK, so I'm gonna, I want to take us to a pivot point in your life and I'm going to do it with my own little bit of a lead in. Um, I was I was in business for you know in the, the business world for 40 years and I met a guy when I was probably 30. He was 45, knew a lot more than I did, and he, we were just talking over dinner and, and he asked me because I was a uh, sales manager. He goes, "What do you look for in somebody that you're looking to hire?" And I went through hard work and da 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 da. And I was wise enough to ask him, "What do you look for?" And he said he only said one thing. He said, "I look for somebody who's been knocked flat on their ass." and got back up and got in the game and won. And um, I had no reference for that because I'd never been knocked flat on my ass. I ended up with a very bad health crisis years later. And as I was working my way back, I realized what he was talking about. He's talking about character that comes out after you've, you, you've had a situation like that. For all of your success as a player and um, eventually as a coach, you got knocked flat on your ass one time through circumstance and a, uh, an event. And if somebody Googled you, they might find this an old headline. So why don't you tell us what happened and what, how that changed you? Yeah, you know, I, I had the opportunity to be humbled um, very shortly after college. And, you know, I was on, you know, cloud nine. It was at the peak of my career. I was going into the pros and had a very storied college uh, career. Um, you know, and, and was out at a bar in Ocean City in, in uh, December, which, you know, if anyone's been to, to Ocean City in December, you know, there's not a whole lot going on. Um, you know, I was with my wife at the time, or my, my, my soon-to-be wife at the time, and, uh, you know, there was a disagreement uh, between the bouncer and I about how we were dancing. You know, he thought he saw something that, that wasn't, and so we very quickly started arguing. I got you know, kicked in the back as he like tackled me from behind. And, you know, I never saw it coming. There was no like, like tap on the shoulder. Hey, buddy, this, it was just like straight to the ground. And so I thought I had been wronged at that time. And, you know, um, him and I got into an argument as we were exiting the, the uh, establishment. And, you know, 
there, there's police officers already there because it's the only thing going on in December. Um, and so, you know, he's yelling at me and I'm yelling at him and the cops saying, you got to go. And so I'm walking away, but you know, we're still both jarring and letting, letting each other know that we're, you know, both in the right. Um, and uh, the cop says, you know, you're under arrest for disturbing. And I, I moved my hand the wrong way. And I have six cops jumping on top of me for resisting arrest. Um, you know, and, and uh, it, it ended up being, you know, a very fateful night for me um, and, and, you know, impacted me in some big ways after that. You know, I, I uh, very quickly, you know, I lost my job. I was coaching and, and kind of had to take a step back and reevaluate everything. I had thought, you know, I was I thought I had been wronged at the time, you know, and for everything that's going on now, it, it thought that I had thought that there was, you know, a little bit of onus on the police for, for going a little bit out of the way to, to make something happen. And then, you know, the, the media gets a hold of it and sensationalizes it because of it's a small town. There's not a lot going on. And you got a guy who's been at the, you know, a pretty high caliber and, and well known in the area. And uh, it just got grabbed a hold of. And, um, you know, reflecting on that, it, it took me a long time. Um, to, to come to grips with it. But, uh, you know, it, it was, I had a big, big ego, big head. I was full of myself. I had, you know, I thought I was untouchable. I thought that, you know, the world should answer to me. And, um, and that's, that's just not the way the world works, right. you know? And, and so I learned through that experience, a, a lot of things uh, when it comes to respect and, and, you know, response and, you know, to go back to the 1090 rule, uh, you know, we mentioned 10% is the game, 90% is the practice, 10% is what happens, 90% is how you react. And I try and I, I try and reflect on that one a lot. I think, you know, all of us, not just kids, I think adults, like that is, that is one that just rings so true. You know, if I can meet you with a smile instead of anger, like the response is going to be so much better, whether it's a seven year old who did something wrong in a game or it's, you know, the, the mom in line who didn't get her Starbucks on time. You know, uh, it's just such a, 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 I think, easy way to sum up a lot of things that happen to us on, on a daily basis. You know, um, I, uh, I, I in, in the business world, I did some consulting work. And one of the things I did is I would come in and meet with customer support and customer service groups. These are the people on the other end of the phone when people are just ripping into them. You know, I opened the box and the product didn't work and you suck and your company sucks. And um, a number of these departments were really struggling with that. And so the first thing I would tell them is, what do you think, for, first of all, look through that email or look through that voicemail and find the complaint because it's probably valid. Hey, the product failed on, on use or whatever. And then try to separate that from all of the emotion in there. And if you need a way to sort of distill the emotion, remember that this person's living a life and their, your product in their hands was a very small part of their day. They may have had somebody just ran over their dog or their kid is sick or they're separated. There, there's so many things that are going on in people's lives that you have no idea. And, um, one of the things you talked to me about was, you know, on the Kyler Berkman menu, there are positive comment sandwiches. And why don't you tell us what a positive comment sandwich is? Yeah. So, you know, I learned this in my, in my coaching theory class, but, you know, I think one of the best ways, not only in coaching, but just in life, like is, is hit them with a positive comment sandwich. And so, you know, that's positive feed like the negative feedback and then another positive. So, you know, Hey, Jimmy, like you're really giving it your all out there. It's great hustle, man. Um, you just, you're shooting sidearm right now. And if you bring it over the top, it, it's going to create a lot more success for you when you finish and you're probably going to score a couple more goals. So try and bring it over the top, but like, dude, you're getting the looks, you're creating the separation, just keep going out there and, and shooting the ball. Um, and so in that, you, you know, you give them the feedback they need and the response is usually a lot better than, you know, Jimmy, what are you doing? Shoot the ball overhand. You know, we talk about rhetorical questions a lot yeah. and, and how negative they can be towards a player or a person's psyche, um, overall. So, so yeah, 
you know, I, I think that that's a, a great way of, of getting across the message as a coach. Um, and, and, you know, I like what you said. You, you do really never know what's going on in a player's life, in a person's life that might be affecting him. You know, I always try and like with my employees now, they'll complain about a parent saying something to them or this, that, and the other. I'm like, look, you, you know, you don't know what's going on. Like they could have 10 different things going on behind the scenes that are making them react the way they are. The, the complaint has nothing to do with it. It is all this other stuff in their life. So, you know, what is it, you know, walk a mile in their shoes. You just, you just never really know. And so it's, it's always great to take a step back and just kind of think about that and, you know, sleep on it before you react too, too harshly. Right. Hey, Kyler, man, it's been an awesome, unbelievable experiences you had. But I think the things that stick out with me on as far as your success, one is having a plan and two is working hard. Would you agree? Absolutely. You know, I, I wasn't uh, I wasn't ever the biggest guy, 5'10", 175 pounds. But I mean, the amount of time that you put in is going to directly correlate to what you get out of it. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. So get out there and give it your best. Yeah, so no matter how much talent you got, it, you know, you can't beat the hard work part. That's awesome. Right All right, listen, man, it was so great having you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Right, man. So we'll wrap up another uh, episode of Chop Shop. I want to thank Kyler Berkman. I want to thank our producer, Lisa Lisa. This is Chopper saying thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.